June 20th in the year 1989, and a, a few years, a little water over the dam, Red Rodney, it, it's good to see that optimistic look in your eye and in your face. Thank you very much. I always love coming back to Minnesota. Well, you, this is one of my favorite cities, and uh, the jazz community here is fantastic. Well, referring to that jazz com community and some of its people, you made a, a legendary friend here. Well, Oscar Pettiford, you mean? Oh, yes, indeed. Well, we were very exceptionally tight. And, uh, yeah, he came from here. In fact, uh, that's where I first met you in 1958, 59, I think, at uh, Oscar's brother Ira's home when we played a, a concert at the university here. Red Rodney, uh, since that time, uh, you've had a chance to think about Oscar and his contributions. And I, I, uh, since you mentioned that you were exceptionally tight, what was it about Oscar that, um, well, that you found so personally rewarding? Well, he was an exceptional player. <clears throat> he was years ahead of his time. You know, in the last 20 years, the bass as an instrument and the bass players have come further in jazz than any other instrument. It's become not only a, a timekeeping instrument like it was, but now it's a great solo instrument. And the young men are virtuosos like the young man I have and so many others. But Oscar Pettiford was one of the progenitors of this entire discipline. He played cello equally as well. You know, I used to feel his fingers. They were smooth as a baby's behind. No calluses. He was sensational. Plus, he was a fine musician, along with being a great instrumentalist. So Oscar was one of the greatest that we've had, and, and look what's happened, and I suspect that it's because of him. More importantly, you know, Copenhagen is a haven for great bass players, beginning with Nils Henning, Orsted Peterson, and there's so many other newer young ones. It all came from Oscar. He settled over there, and he was the great influence. And that little country of only four million people has the greatest basis in the world per capita. Red Rodney, the adventures with Woody Herman and with Oscar Pettiford was a very special segment in not only your life, but at Pettiford's as well. And what do you recall about uh, uh, that uh, particular period? Well, that was the first real big name band that uh, I had great bebop soloists. And uh, we had the four brothers, Stan and Al and Zood and Serge. And we had Bill Harris and Earl Smope. And we had uh, the trumpets, Ernie Royal and myself, Shorty Rogers. Lou Levy, Ralph Burns before that, Chubby Jackson, who was not really a soloist, but then Oscar Pettiford came in. And uh, I mean, Chubby, what he wanted two bases for a while, but Chubby couldn't stay once Oscar was there. And I love Chubby, but he was a comedian. That's what he wanted to be. Oscar was the bassist. And it was a wonderful band. And, and uh, I was about to leave. Oscar caused me to stay an extra six, seven months, really, because we were so friendly and I enjoyed being with him and playing with him. I only left because Charlie Parker called me. And, and that's when I left. <clears throat> A June night in the year of 1989, the Artist Quarter, 26th and Nicollet here in Minneapolis, and the journey and adventure in jazz, and with it, the guide, Red Rodney. Red, um, your musical directions now, I, I read something in the Chicago Tribune about uh, a reference to bebop of the 90s. Would you please uh, explain that? Well, that's what I, I, I think we're doing. Because, you know, I'm primarily a bebop soloist. But also, I like to stay modern and contemporary. You see, I've got young men in my band, and they have uh, really taught me a great deal. I, in turn, give them all the discipline and the roots and traditions that they have lacked. So it's a good meeting. Meanwhile, I've been able to stay ahead and stay up to date. Many of my dear friends and contemporaries have not done this. It's okay. 
they remain in their comfort zone and they, it's okay because they played so great, they should be able to do whatever they want to do. And if they feel that way, fine. But it's incumbent upon me to continue growing. And I have made the greatest improvement between the ages of 50 and 60, musically. And uh, that's as it should be. I want to continue growing, and I, I'm 62 now. I want the next 10 years to be even more modern. And, but I say modern with a melodic content. That's where the bebop of the 90s comes in. When they go out, and they're young men, and I allow them to go out and get free, but I always look at them and say, if you're going to play snake charming music, I want to hear some melody. Is there a comfort zone for you? Oh, sure. Sure, there's a comfort zone. I'm primarily a bebop soloist. Bebop is the most challenging of all jazz idioms. But to play 1940s and early 50s bebop is like yesterday's warmed over mashed potatoes. I, I want to be challenged by the music of today. And that's why I, I consider it bebop of the 90s. I think it was very perceptive of that one critic to uh, point that out. In your, um, in your review of the history that you've been a part of, and certainly you've been probed to the hilt on Charlie Parker, and I can remember Charlie in a telephone conversation telling me about his love for Bartok and all of that lovely music. Did he share that with you? Very little. I, I knew that he enjoyed listening to classical music because when we would take drives to different cities, when we would drive, he'd put the classical stations on. But no, he didn't uh, uh, address that subject at all. What else did you observe as you made those one night stands and broad jumps about the mystique and personality, aside from Clint Eastwood's film, which leaves us wondering what his contributions were, what were those contributions? I was very disappointed in the film. I thought Chan, whom I like very much, and I'm not trying to denigrate her, I thought she sold Eastwood a bill of goods. It was the Charlie and Chan Parker story, and he, Clint Eastwood, whom was a great guy, a very nice, unassuming man who loves jazz, he didn't show us why a man like him made a film about a man like Charlie Parker. But, as be as it may, we all owe him a debt of gratitude because he made it, he did it. Um, I noticed from that film, everybody was a consultant, and yet no one was a consultant, but everybody knew a different bird. I was a very close friend for about eight years, maybe nine years. Um, and I knew many things, but there were many things I didn't know about him. Everybody saw him differently, I guess. But I'll tell you this, he was a very kind, thoughtful, considerate man who was very good to a young trumpet player who was not ready to be there. When you say not ready to be there, is that a, a statement concerning your musical skills? Oh, of course. I, I wasn't ready to play with Charlie Parker at that time. I don't know if I ever got ready, really, but... Oh, I did, of course. Um, and I told him so when he first called me. I, in fact, the picture even showed that. I said that there was Fats Navarro, who was my favorite. And Kenny D uh, Durham. And he said, maybe. He says, but I know a good trumpet player when I hear one. Besides, I want you. He liked me personally, which should never temper, never be the cause of that, but still... He did it, and it was to my benefit, because what it was for me, it was like going to college and then graduate school all at the same time. Thank you very much. Thank you. It's intermission at the artist quarter. The next show goes on, and on stand will be on the business end of a flugelhorn and a trumpet, an exciting figure in the annals of American music, Red Rodney. Red, you speak with uh, the spirit of eternal youth. Well, I hope I can continue speaking like that, but 
believe me, it's, it's, it's not that youthful anymore, <laughs> especially when you're on the road with young men. Uh, I, I'm very lucky they help me a lot, but it's hard. It's very hard. I need all the rest I can get when I'm out here on the road. So I do. During intermission, you notice I hide in a little booth, get away from everything. And I, I go right to bed because I want to keep doing this for another 10 or 20 years if I can. And you have to get all your rest. On the subject of the future of jazz, how do you see it as it plays out in a number of different mediums? That is, the presentation side, the medium of recordings, uh, and the new technologies. Any one of those thoughts or all of them? I think jazz has a tremendous opportunity right now. It's going to keep growing. We have young people in colleges. There are over 400 Jazz Institute courses in the various colleges in America. And because of that, we now have the most sophisticated audiences in the world. We never could say that before. Besides, the young musicians are well-educated, very proficient, and very dedicated. There's no drugs in jazz, none at all. They don't smoke, they don't drink. They're dedicated players. And now, the electronic instruments are with us. Up until now, they have taken over. Now it's time for the jazz musician to use those instruments and make jazz with it. We have a, another album coming out. It's going to be called Code Red. And I didn't want to do it. The guys made me do it. The young guys have been in my band a long time. Gary Dial, 10 years. Dick Oates, 5 years. He's not here tonight. He had a record date in New York with Flynn and the BBs. And he had to go do that. So we have a local uh, Gary Berg is subbing, who's doing a great job, by the way. But anyway, they asked me to do that while we were making this No Turn on Red. And I had to give them the respect, you know, because they've been with me so many years. And I know that they're good enough musicians to know what I will be comfortable or not. And they assured me we were going to play jazz. And this is the first attempt, I think, of uh, jazz musicians using those instruments instead of those instruments using us. And we're going to have more and more of that. I think the future is wonderful. I also think that in the near future, maybe five, ten years, you'll find very few clubs like this where there's smoking and drinking and selling liquor. You'll have little recital halls, but with sets, not like concert halls, recital halls, but people can come in, have a set, then a next set, then another set, and be comfortable and just listen to the music. No distractions. And more and more, and the jazz societies of America are building on that premise. So it's going to be a whole brand new thing. I hope that I can live play long enough to see it. But mark my words, it's coming. We're in very good shape. Off stage at the artist quarter, the month of June of the year 1989, and the images of jazz, and they just seem to be floating around us. I'm seated opposite Red Rodney, whom I would like to ask, as you sat up in that marvelous brass section in Woody Herman's band as a young musician, what were you thinking about as you uh, honed your skill up there with those brass players around you? This is gonna surprise you very much. I couldn't wait to get the hell out of there. I wanted to play in a small band so I can brush up and hone up my skills as a jazz player. The big band, I had started in big bands when I was 16. And I had enough of them. I learned to play in them. That was my kindergarten, elementary school. I had enough of them. I had now heard jazz. 52nd Street was available to me. I heard Dizzy. I heard Bird, I heard all of the jazz stars. Wow, I flipped out. That's what I wanted. I couldn't wait to get out of there. Even though it was a great band and I loved all the guys in the band, I couldn't wait to get out. When you found that freedom, then what did you discover? 
well, I discovered that's what I want to do the rest of my life. And it takes a lifetime to do it. Uh, as you know, I'm playing better now than I've ever played because I want to continue growing. And, uh, but now, some things never change. I'm going to be leading the Finnish radio big band for 17 concerts in uh, the end of October. And uh, it's funny, uh, they came to see me at the Village Vanguard just three weeks ago, and they asked me what tunes we, I would want. And they wanted a Charlie Parker program included. And I named six or seven bird tunes, and they had arrangements on all of them. So I think I'm going to have a good band, and I'll be the leader in soloist. So that's, that's coming full circle. And you're back to the discipline. Yeah, back again. Except this time I'm standing in front and playing. I'm not restricted by an 8-bar or 16-bar solo.